A lot of people may want to hop into the gig economy to make some extra money, whether that be with food delivery or with rideshare. The problem is a lot of people don't want to put that much mileage on their car and who can be blamed for that? That's why in this video, I'm going to be sharing my experience while rented from rideshare cars. I'll be sharing how much money I made before expenses, what those expenses actually were. I'll also talk about the process that I went to, the pros, such as obviously not needing to use your own car to make money, and some of the cons. So let's get into it. Sup everyone, this is Elijah with the Rideshare Guy. In this video, I'm gonna be sharing my experience renting a car to go drive in the gig economy from Rideshare Cars. So the overall experience of renting a car was actually uh, pretty simple, mainly because I use a company called Rideshare Cars. They have an app that you download, then from there you select the car that you want to rent out for a duration of time. The type of car as well as the cost per day appears on the screen, and when you select it, you schedule a time to go pick up the car from the rideshare dealership. Once I arrived at the dealership, it took about 15 to 20 minutes to actually sign the paperwork and to get set up so that I was uh, eligible to drive the car on all the platforms I was gonna be using, which in this case was gonna be Uber, Lyft, and DoorDash. One thing I will say about rideshare cars is they do allow you to drive for whatever service that you want to, so you're not fully anchored down to just driving for Uber or just driving for Lyft or one company. You have the freedom to multi app which is a nice touch. They also have a huge emphasis on educating rideshare drivers and gig workers because a lot of people hop into the industry but there's no formal training by the companies. So one thing I do like is they have uh, resources available to educate drivers on exactly how things work in the gig economy. That probably is the case because the uh, founder Shermis is actually a rideshare driver He's given over 4,000 rides and has a 4.9 star rating on Uber. So he can relate to us the problems that we face on a regular basis, as well as the ways that we can use to tackle the set problems and become profitable. The plan was to actually do rideshare and delivery, but for whatever reason, a Lyft took a long time uh, updating my insurance. And uh, when it was updated, they had some problem with a background check. I actually updated all my Lyft information a week ahead of time just so I wouldn't have any problems, but I still ended up having the problem, so I wasn't eligible to drive for the duration of the time that I had the uh, rental vehicle on Lyft, which is kind of a bummer, but it is what it is. But uh, my paperwork got approved on Uber literally within an hour. So I drove a total of five hours on Friday, which came out to be around $95. And on Saturday, I was able to drive eight hours from 4 p.m to midnight. Now originally I was going to uh, do rideshare and delivery, but uh, like I mentioned, the Lyft app w wasn't able to come into play. And it was just abnormally slow on the rideshare side anyway, but it was sizzling on the delivery side. So I mainly stuck to doing Uber Eats and DoorDash. So on Saturday for one hour, I was really trying to get a decent rideshare request between four and five before I just say, you know what, screw it. Let's just take these deliveries. So if you wanted to, you could actually X out the 4 p.m. to 5 p.m. because I wasn't trying to get a delivery during that time. And that would actually decrease the hours from eight hours to seven hours. That would put me at around $20 per hour if we're rounding up a little. But if you wanted to include that dead hour while I was waiting for a rideshare ping, it would be $17.38 per hour. As far as how much I paid for the rental, the price is dynamic, so it is going to vary depending on what's going on in the uh, rental markets. But as you could uh, probably imagine, the prices right now are inflated because of uh, what's going on in the market. So the cost per day for a newer car was uh, $89 per day. And for some of the older cars that they're offering, it was $75 per day. Like I mentioned before, that is dynamic and prices are inflated because of the market. So one thing you'll probably want to do is uh, just take a look at what's going on in the overall market and uh, see if the numbers line up in your favor when renting a, a car for rideshare or delivery. It should also be noted that uh, that rental cost covers insurance, maintenance, tolls, dash cams, which one is actually provided in the vehicle for you, which is a nice touch by uh, rideshare cars, and of course the state and uh, rental fees. So all that is clumped into that final price that I mentioned before. As far as the exact car that I drove, I got a chance to drive a Kia Forte 2022, which I could personally say was uh, pretty fun to drive. It's a very uh, luxury-like kind of car. With that being said, let's get into the pros of uh, my experience that I had renting a car to use for gig work. So let's go into the pros of renting a car to do rideshare or delivery. 
First off is obviously you won't be using your own car. That means that all the depreciation that your car will be taking won't be on the table. I drove a little over 200 miles while I did my rental with rideshare cars. And the beautiful thing is none of those miles affect the car that I'm sitting in right now. Since everything that makes the car go round, such as the wheels, the transmission, the engine, have their own lifespan before they go out and need to be replaced, this is definitely a big pro. Speaking of lifespan, depreciation of a vehicle is a big deal. As you can see, the mileage can start adding up pretty fast. Imagine if I kept on with that trajectory every week. We say I would put around maybe five to 600 miles on my car every week. That starts to add up pretty fast. That's why one of the biggest pros is you get to make money in the gig economy without using your car. Another pro is based on what car you get, you may actually have a chance to drive uh, one of the brand newer cars like a 2022 version or 2023 version if you're watching this video later. I can't really see a downside to that. I mean, all the newest cars have the newest features. I'm not gonna go into what they are because by the time you see this video, there's a good chance that they've changed those features and updated them even more. I don't know what to say. It's a big pro to me. Another pro is to get a car that's very gas efficient. So in general, you will have some choices when it comes to what car you want to rent, depending on what company you go with. We're gonna use Rideshare Cars as an example here. All their cars are very gas efficient because they are specifically focused in cars that are good for gig drivers to drive in. That means that you can put more mileage on your car before needing to fill up at the pump. And for those of y'all that don't know, gas is our biggest expense outside of taxes. So how's that not a pro? A fourth pro is that the car that you drive is going to be covered from an insurance perspective if you're using it for rideshare slash delivery. If you're renting a car from rideshare or delivery using a platform that obviously uh, knows what you're going to be using it for, they're going to be sure to make sure that vehicle is covered with rideshare slash delivery insurance. This can be something that uh, a lot of people may just not want to take care of in terms of getting their own personal vehicle insured with rideshare or delivery insurance. In fact, a lot of people just skip this step altogether because they don't want to deal with it. But what happens if you get in a wreck? Then you'll have to disclose that you were using your car for commercial purposes if you're doing rideshare or delivery. And if you don't have a policy that covers that, there's a good chance you'll get dropped from your insurance provider. In fact, nowadays, if a company has your information on file and you just decide to get a quote for how much rideshare and delivery insurance would cost, they may list you in the official insurance database as a rideshare driver, which means that at that point, you might be kind of forced to get rideshare or delivery insurance because uh, insurance companies are gonna see that you use your vehicle for commercial purposes and they're gonna, either gonna charge you accordingly or they're not gonna give you a policy. Well, none of that comes into play if you decide to uh, rent a vehicle to do rideshare or delivery. It's going to be all taken care of for you so you can drive with more peace of mind. And in my book, peace of mind is a pro. And the last pro may be a little contingent upon my particular situation, but a dash cam comes in the car already installed that uh, shows what's going on in front of you and also behind you. Now, this is something that rideshare cars are offers in their vehicles. So I can't personally speak for other uh, rental companies to say if they provide it or not. I think they're all moving in that general direction. In fact, that's something you might want to actually double up on and check on. But all that footage is being recorded. And if something was to happen while I was renting the car, all I would need to do is uh, contact rideshare cars and they would have pulled the footage from that particular day and uh, found the incident, if you will. Then they'd be able to uh, give me that footage so that I can use it as, a, as, as needed. If you've been following the rideshare guide for some time now, you know that we highly, highly, highly recommend that you get a dash cam if you're gonna be doing rideshare driving and to some degree, even delivery driving, as if you do get in some kind of wreck, it's good to be able to see everything from all angles. Well, this is something that could be provided if you decide to rent a car when it comes to doing gig work. Since we've covered the pros, we do need to uh, cover the uh, cons. So uh, probably the biggest con is there is a uh, rental fee. There's no uh, getting around that. Keep in mind that this is obviously unnecessary, but it is a rental fee that you'll have to take into consideration. So you'll definitely want to know uh, your market, what's your market capable of, where are you going to drive when you do rent the car to maximize your earnings. You do want to have uh, some kind of game plan, if possible, prior to actually renting so that you can maximize uh, earnings so that uh, it can offset the cost of the uh, rental itself. Another con is, depending on your situation, it might be inconvenient 
to uh, find transportation to the dealership to pick the uh, car up because in a lot of cases they may not let you just park your car at the dealership until you're finished with your rental term that may not be an option so you'll need to arrange to get transportation to go to the uh, dealership when initially picking the car up that could be hopping in an uber or lyft yourself or you know making arrangements with you know friends and family now that we've covered the pros and cons let's cover the potential of like how much I could have actually made if I had time to drive more. Just so y'all can get proper context, I drove from uh, 4 p.m. to uh, midnight on Saturday, and you see how much I made uh, on the screen. If we're just gonna count delivery time, we can actually cut that out. So if you do the math, it comes out to be close to around $20 uh, per hour on that Saturday. But truth be told, I could have made more money if I did one of two things. If I would have started my day earlier, let's say at 11 o'clock and did the lunch rush, we can go ahead and work with that per hour of around $20 per hour because that's about part of course for my particular market. I could have did the lunch rush from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. at $20 per hour gives me an extra 60 bucks to add on top of what I've already made. I could have grabbed something to eat between the hours of 2 and 4 p.m. and then started the shift that I actually did which is from 4 to midnight. The second thing I could have did is I didn't have to stop at midnight. I could have started my trips at 4 p.m. like I had initially did, but instead of ending at midnight, I could have, you know, grabbed a snack or grabbed something to eat for, let's say, 30 minutes. And then I could have uh, went until the end of the uh, bar rush. That would have been at 3 o'clock. Working with our example, we still use $20 per hour, although on Uber Eats, there would be surge, so there's a chance it would be higher but we're still gonna go ahead and uh, use $20 per hour for the average. So that would still be an extra 60 bucks on top of what I was already making on the shift that I had already did. That would have brought my total earnings up from 139 to around 199, which if we're just gonna go ahead and round up, we could just go ahead and say uh, $200. The reason those weren't options for me is because I do have a property on Airbnb and I had a guest checking out that day. So I had to go and uh, clean the property for the next guest in the upper part of that day so i wasn't available to do the lunch shift and uh when it came around time midnight i don't want to overwork myself so i didn't want to go to the bar rush because that would have been like pushing uh, over 12 hours in terms of total work even though all that work wasn't in the gig economy now that we've covered the pros and cons i'm going to share with you what i would do differently so the main thing that i would have done different and um this could be done as soon as you finish this video if you wanted to but uh i would just uh make sure that everything is clear for both uber and lyft prior to going to the dealership now keep in mind that's what i did but apparently a week's notice wasn't enough for lyft so just really as soon as possible make sure everything is straightened out they've done their background check which i guess takes two or three weeks just so you have access to every platform when you do end up in a, a rental that you're going to use for gig work this is assuming using a company like a rise your cars that uh, doesn't mind you multi-apping. Obviously, if you use a different company, you might be stuck to one app and that could be another issue in itself. The second thing I would have did differently is I would have arranged to pick up the car as early as possible so that I could maximize my earnings. So a uh, rideshare cars dealership actually opens up at 9 a.m. So I would have been there at around 9.15, 9.30, really as soon as possible. I would arrange to pick up the car around then you know, spend like 15 or 20 minutes signing the paperwork and getting it uh, eligible on all the platforms, and particularly uh, delivery. And, you know, the rideshare platforms like Uber and Lyft probably would take like an hour or two to get the ball rolling. I would go grab some breakfast and uh, wait till around 10.30 or 11 and uh, take advantage of the lunch rush when it comes to delivery apps like Uber Eats and DoorDash. Do delivery from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m., and probably make between 60 to 80 bucks, which is about a pretty normal in my market. By that time, the rideshare platform should have approved my insurance and my paperwork, so I would be eligible to drive rideshare from that point. From there, I'd be able to take advantage of both a rideshare and delivery for the rest of that day. The third thing is I would make sure that I would be available to a drive 12 hours that day or days that I would have the uh, rental because that's the uh, way I can maximize my income. One thing I have mentioned is the per hour earnings, but I did so for the sake of really communication. I actually would like to move away from that and focus on profit and loss. 
So the overall money that I make while in the rental car will be my gross earnings. And then I have my expenses, which is how much the car costs to rent that day and uh, gas. So that's going to be subtracted from my gross earnings, which will give me my net earnings. If I can make more money to boost those gross earnings, by default, my net earnings will go up as long as my mileage per gallon from a gas perspective is semi-decent. And we've already covered in this case, it is. So like I mentioned before, I would have slid another three to four hours in on Saturday, which would have boosted my gross earnings significantly, and it would have made my net earnings uh, that much more favorable. So with that being said, I've shared my experience using rideshare cars when it comes to renting a car to do gig work for a weekend. Overall, I enjoyed my experience and I definitely wouldn't mind doing it again, as this time around, I'm a little more hesitant about putting more uh, mileage on my car, just because my ride is getting a little older, so I just, uh, care more about putting it through the ringer, so to speak. The good news about that is, just because I don't wanna drive my personal vehicle anymore for the gig economy as much, doesn't mean that I have to miss out on what the gig economy has to offer. There are plenty of rental options available to rent a car and still make money using the gig economy. That does it for this video. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them in the comment section below. And don't forget to subscribe if you're new as we drop videos on a weekly basis about the gig economy, tactics you can use to be successful, as well as up and coming news. It's been Elijah with The Rideshare Guy. I will catch you in the next video. Be safe, be profitable everyone.